My name is Jim McKees. Thanks for joining uh, Learn to Code Summer Camp 2021. I really enjoy this event. It's a lot of fun. The response we've had this year is phenomenal, and I've changed some things trying to accommodate more people and um, didn't come out the way I wanted to get. So this is a kind of an intro uh, overview of the camp and an intro programming session. Uh, definitely going to be very open to taking your questions as we go along. Uh, if your questions are beyond the scope of what I'm talking about right now, I'll put, put them off till the end in order to have time to address the main content I want to do, but I do definitely want to try and get to everybody's questions as much as possible. Uh, this is sponsored by Embarcadero. It, I work for Embarcadero, which I'll talk about who I am in a second. Actually, I want to go, I'm trying something, another thing I'm trying differently is a live translation through Microsoft's Translate service. So if English is not your native language, oops, let me go this here. I set up this translate room here, let me turn it on. So if you come and join this translate room, you will get a live translation or live transcription of what I'm saying. It'll transcribe what I'm saying into English and then translate it into your language of choice. So you can, I'll put the link in the chat, join that and it will provide you a text based translation into other languages. We'll see how this goes. Although the transcription seems pretty good. It, it's amazing how much this technology comes along. So about me really quick, my name is Jim McKees. I am, see, originally I had planned that it was gonna composite, put me over here on the right-hand side, but uh, didn't work with OBS. I'll figure it out for next time. I am the Embarcadero Chief Developer Advocate and Engineer, mostly focused on developer advocacy, but they, because I've uh, actually written some code that shipped with Delphi, which I'm pretty excited about, lifelong dream. They, I'm an engineer as well, but my main focus is developer advocacy, which is, the idea of talking to developers and helping developers be awesome, that's the way I like to describe it. I am really excited about software development and sharing knowledge and information with people. I'm a longtime software developer, started developing back in the 80s on a Commodore VIC-20 and immediately knew this is what I wanted to do with my life and have been working towards this ever since. My claim to fame though, well, actually as I listed some of the languages I've worked with, originally I started out with like batch files or basic on Commodore batch files and just over Turo Pascal and thought this is amazing. But I've also went and done a number of other languages and taught uh, classes in other languages as well. I did a boot camp in Android development with Java, Objective-C, JavaScript, Python. Each one I've, oh, says my mic's translated. Is it not? Oh, it stopped translating. That's weird. Um, I wonder if it, it was working a second ago. Ah, come on. Continue allowing. Hello, testing, testing. All right, sorry. Um, Mike stays on. Okay, there we go. Now it should keep my microphone unmuted and. Ooh, vibrant. Okay, so let me unmute and mute again. Mic stays on. So now I'm speaking and it's not picking me up. Oh, it changed microphones. The, um,
this was working a second ago. Oh, come on. All right, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave the room and join again, I think. Let me try that. That's set the right microphone now, but now it won't connect to it. Still logged in. Apologies for this. I love technology, but it's amazing how often it just goes sideways on me. Okay, this one seems to be working. So let me copy this code and put it in the other chat room. Okay, this is still has our microphone unmuted. Good, microphone stays on. Display P speech output. Oh no, I don't want to play speech output, okay. So let me switch back and then come back again and see if this is still translating. Okay, it is transcribing. Back to, yeah, it's using the same microphone. I tested earlier and it was able to work with two microphones, although, all right, it seems to be working now. Let me double check again. Yep, still working. Apologies. I, I love technology and I love trying new things. And <laughs> it's amazing how often it doesn't always work right the first time. That's okay. But I worked in a lot of different computer programming languages. I keep going back to Delphi as my favorite, but I honestly and truly believe that all developers or all good developers probably are gonna have multiple languages in their tool belt. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is in the presentation later. So I think it's good to know multiple languages and be familiar with multiple languages, but at the same time, it's also a good idea to have one that's maybe your preferred language that you have the most knowledge in. And for me, that's Delphi. My claim to fame, though, is I, let's see. Yeah, I've got that next slide. Claim to fame is I invented and patented Swipe to Unlock, which is the, the, the one that iOS used when you just swipe or the pattern unlock on Android. Both of those fall under a patent of mine around drawing geometric shapes to provide authentication to a computer that you are or are not who you say you are. I, it, the interesting thing about this is I, was working for a computer company way back in the day as a software engineer, and I had submitted a patent around this and kind of forgotten about it, and I moved on to a new company. I knew I had a few patents, and one day I get a call from UPS, and they're like, hey, we're, oh, wait, sorry. I get a yeah, I get a call from UPS saying, hey, we're trying to deliver a package, but your, I guess it's FedEx, but your address has changed, and I'm like, oh, okay, here's my new address, and they're like, okay, we'll get it to you tomorrow. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going out of town camping for the weekend. I'll get it on Monday. So I go camping, come back Monday, I got my FedEx package and I'm looking at the news and I see a news headline. And this was back when Apple and Samsung were in the big lawsuit about patent infringement saying, Apple didn't invent swipe to unlock, Jim McKeith did on the headline. And I'm like, that's my name. So, and then I'm like, wait. And I look over at the FedEx package, I grab it and rip it open. And sure enough, it's for that patent. The uh, company who I'd no longer worked for was filing an extension for it because also they discovered it was more interesting than they thought it was before. <laughs> So that's my claim to fame. I, I got a little bit of money at the time for the company I was working for as a bonus, but I don't get uh, royalties from anybody involved in this, but it is a lot of fun to share that and talk about that in my uh, presentations. Another thing I did that I thought was really interesting is I built a brain or a thought controlled drone 
with Google Glass and it used an apparent AR drone. So apparent, which a real popular early on drone um, that you could, it was semi-autonomous in that it could stay put and it could avoid obstacles and stuff like that, but it had like leveling. And then I got this off the shelf emotive Epic EEG brain computer interface headset wireless and Google Glass, which was big a while back now, you're hard to hear about it anymore. And I built a system where you could wear Google Glass and you could talk to Google Glass and then uh, to pair it to the drone and the headset. And then it would use the headset, you would train the headset so that it would be able to recognize certain thought patterns in your brain and would display what thoughts it was recognizing, what patterns it was recognizing. And so you'd train it what you wanted to do to go up, forward, what it, rotate, however. And so once you trained it, it would then recognize that pattern again and the drone would behave appropriately. So that was a lot of fun. Went around and showed that off. It was I put together most of the code in that in about a weekend with some existing libraries, which was a lot of fun. And lastly, I'm a contributor to the Inner of Things and Data Analytics Handbook. I did a chapter on uh, the brain computer interface in the Internet of Things. So uh, just a quick overview of the main schedule or main um, stream in, or uh, a couple things. So, the, if you go to the, the URL you see there, most of you probably already have been there, you will find a, a list of a couple different streams that are available. There's the main stream, which is the one we're on now. And on the main stream, we have four sessions today, the one we're on right now, which is the kickoff and intro to programming. Then at 2 p.m. Central Time, I should say Central Time here, it will do installing an introduction to Delphi, 10.42 uh, Community Edition. At uh, 3 p.m., we'll do C++ Builder. And then, oh, we put the new code in here. Thank you. For translator. Sorry about that. Thanks for asking, Herbert. So I'm trying to pay attention to the, the chat stream here as well. Um, and then at 4 p.m. Central Time, I'll do installing an intro to PyScriptor and Python. Tomorrow, uh, so there'll be other things beyond the mainstream. This is the mainstream, and there'll probably be some more sessions added tomorrow. I'm still adding sessions based on uh, volunteers that have volunteered to create content. Uh, there's Danny Wind has a session. Actually, let me just jump out there. So this morning, here's the, so this is an interesting thing I found. This is the breakdown, and this is why I wanted to look at translation things. And somebody, I forget your name, I apologize, was telling about Translate, Microsoft Translate, which I had heard of before, but I didn't know it was this easy to use, and sent me a link, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely using that. But I'd wanted to do this ahead of time to do some pre-translation, but if this live translation works out, that's even better, right? But here's a breakdown of where in the world everybody comes from. And I love the fact that the top 10 countries is almost is just barely more than the rest of the countries, out of 165 countries combined. We had this last night we had 106,727 students registered. Really exciting stuff. Uh, we had a session this morning with Dave, Dr. Kevin Bond talking about his book in Del uh, uh, effective how to eff program effectively in Delphi. He creates books for the school system in the UK, and uh, this book's like. I think he said it was a thousand pages or something like that. I, it's huge. And he has a preview available, which I actually bought this morning for 20 pounds. I knew he had the book. I had read some of his sample chapters, but I did look at actually getting the preview. So uh, I'll get the replay up from this as soon as possible, but you can go out there. Here's some videos of the first six classes of his. You can watch these now on demand and I'll get the replay of the Q&A session we have with him as well. And then starting tomorrow, we have an introduction to REST web services in Delphi with Danny Wynn. This is probably a little bit more advanced, but a nice introduction. So if you have some basics of computer programming, uh, basic familiar with Delphi, you can jump into that one as a, um, a, an introduction. And so then uh, each day there'll be a new blog post and there'll be a link from this blog post and the main blog post pointing to the new blog post with the schedule for the day. Uh, I will get the schedule for tomorrow up by the end of day today, so check back then. So now let's jump into the intro to programming. Uh, this is going to be kind of uh, 
theoretical high level conversation, if you will. Definitely open to your questions. I kind of try and want to explain some of the concepts and the ideas and the ways of thinking behind programming. Uh, one note about myself, I am not, I did not go to college to learn programming. Like I said, I started programming very young and just had a passion for it and had discovered a few mentors that helped me and I was self-taught and went down that path. Since then, I have taken a few summer classes to learn a few other things and try to read different books and stuff like that. But there are things that I don't have as a result of lack of formal education. Now, chances are you're here, you don't have a degree in computer science either. But uh, for example, if you go after, if you check out Dr. Kevin Bond's book, he has a degree, he is gonna come at it from a different point of view. So I recommend getting both sides of it. So my side will definitely be different. Can we learn how to create games? Yes, so I will have some content later in the week around games specifically, and we'll point to some other resources for that too. But I'm not gonna jump into games just yet, uh, but I will talk a little bit about games um, later in the week. So programming is about problem solving. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to be aware of. Question about will there be certificates be provided in this webinar? Not this week. I wanted to make certificates available, but I haven't done that yet. Um, had a lot of stuff going on. I hope to have some certificates available later that you can come back and uh, complete the, because we're going to have some questions in it that you can answer to uh, show that you've understood the material. So based on attendance and understanding the materials and that attendance can be through the replays as well. Hopefully we'll get that put together, but there's a lot of a lot of logistics and a lot of stuff moving around. So I'm doing the best I can. I really do appreciate everybody's patience though as well. And I will do my best to get a option available for certification. Now the certificates I'll be providing will not be recognized necessarily by any uh, educational standards body, they will just say that you did, were involved in this course and that you uh, completed the, the testing. So um, astronomy is the study of stars in space, not telescopes. So I think this is a really important thing. Was, I can't remember, I think it was Galileo. Maybe it wasn't Galileo. Somebody said this famous quote, I should have looked it up, but a lot of People think computer programming, computer science is the study of computers, and it's not really, it's it's a beyond that. Computing, computers existed before the electronic computer we have today. If you watch the NASA, or the, uh, the movie, recent movie about hidden figures, it was about a number of African-American women who were computers for NASA. And they were computers in that they did computing, they did calculations. So, uh, that's where the term comes from. What we have today is called an electronic computer, which they also had analog computers, which is kind of interesting as well. But the computer we have today is a tool used in computing, but we think of it because we call it computer as uh, all about computing. So the multiple hours in the registration are, do represent different the different time slots, which will be in the description of that. Some of them are already in there. Um, I will update it though after the session to make sure that it is accurate and complete. So just as telescopes are not, or just as uh, astronomy is not about telescopes, it's about stars. Computer science is not about computers necessarily. It is about computing. Now, that being said, some of it does apply to computing directly. There are, a lot of it is computing related. So some of the concepts we're going to cover aren't necessarily related directly to computer programming, but can be beyond that as well. Programming really is about breaking problems down into smaller pieces. So it, like, for example, uh, Omar asked about making games. A game is a big thing, right? but you have to be able to break down what makes to do a game in order to make it. So you have to break down the steps of the game to create the game. You've probably heard this before. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It's the same thing with computer programming. You can't just say, boop, game. You have to break it down into smaller pieces, implement those individual pieces, put them all back together again, and you have your game or your elephant. 
So programming is really about learning to use the right tool in the right way for each problem. Oh, oops, someone said the translation stopped again. Why does this keep stopping? Oh, I wonder if it's putting the tab to sleep because in the background, why does it stopped again? Um, all right, let me try something. It works for a while, but then when it's in the background, it stops working. All right. So let me see if I do this. I'm excited to see so many people in here. Sorry, it's not working better. Uh, let's see. Join conversation. Let me try joining this room from a different browser and then promoting myself to be able to speak. All right. So now it should be taking translation from here. All right, that looks good. Oh, it's stopped again. Oh, I have to come in here. Mic stays on. So now it should be getting a translation for the other browser window because this browser window stopped working. Okay. I will try and keep an eye on this so it doesn't time out on me again. But I am. I have another, what I did is I opened another browser window that I've got in the foreground over here. And so hopefully it won't go to sleep and think I'm not using it anymore because it is the only focused window in that browser. So programming is learning to use the right tool in the right way for each problem. So it, breaking it down, that tool may be an algorithm or a function call or something along those lines, a way of optimizing and solving for that uh, problem. It's also about finding the best way between two points. This is kind of optimization. As a lot of times in programming, there may be multiple ways to get something done, but each one's gonna have trade-offs. Some of them may be faster, in running some of them may be more secure some of them may be more reliable and so over time you will learn the the pros and cons the differences between those different mechanisms different ways of doing that and be able to make that choice of the best way to do things but at the end of the day writing a program is a lot like creating a recipe for the computer now, if you've ever followed a recipe before, you know that it has a series of steps and tells you exactly what to do and how to do it. When you're first starting to cook, you get a recipe book and you follow, or at least you should follow that recipe exactly. And then as you learn to understand the science of what's going on there, because really cooking is a science, then you can adapt that recipe and make changes to the recipe. So the first time you cook something, you follow the recipe exactly. And then the next time you're like, oh, I wonder if I change this or I substitute this, or if I add more of this or take some of this out, then you can customize that recipe to give it your own version, your own variation and improve on it. So with the computer, the the computer will make whatever recipe you give it. So if you get a recipe for a peanut butter jelly sandwich, it'll make you a peanut butter jelly sandwich each time. It does what you tell it to do. Uh, there's a really fascinating or amusing, entertaining, I'm not sure the right term, uh, experiment you can do with this, where you have somebody write down a recipe or a set of instructions on how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. And a... Um, second a few questions here
Okay, so I see a few questions here that I will get to in a little bit, but uh, not going to be able to get to right now. Yeah, I did open another window without minim instead of minimizing it for the translation. Anyway, there's a you probably find a video of this online, um, and I was going to put it in here, but I didn't. Where you have somebody, uh, this is great for kids, for example, or anybody really. You say write down exactly how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and they will say, uh, you know, take two slices of bread from the bag. Uh, put peanut butter on one piece and jelly on the other and then put it together. And so then you being a smart ally instructor can say, okay, take two bags, slices of bread out of the bag. You could tear the bag open and then pull two slices out and then put the jar of peanut butter on one slice of bread and the jar of jelly on the other slice of bread and then smash it together. That's not a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but you follow the directions. So th this is an analogy to computer programming in that you, uh, they have to be explicit or the right level of explicit for what you're telling the computer to do because it will do literally what you say whether or not it's what you meant for it to do or not there's two things that computers are really really good at following directions doing exactly what you tell them to do and doing it really fast they go really really fast uh, there was a famous quote, uh, which again, I should have put it on who the quote was by, that computers are dumb, but they're really, really fast. It, today, there's a lot of things we do that challenges the notion of computers being dumb, but at the end of when you get down to all the layers of abstraction, they're just dumb. They don't understand what they're doing, but they follow directions, whatever those directions happen to be. And sometimes those directions you give it, those instructions you give it, give it the appearance or the ability to behave intelligently, but it's still just following directions. So why learn computer programming? Since you're here, you probably have your own reasons already. Um, let's see, oh, there's a question here I do want to answer. Is it necessary to be good at math in order to learn programming? That's a really good question. Um, let me. Actually, I'm going to stop here for a second and then go through some of these questions so we could or stop the screen share. Yeah, this is very good math kind of programming. Yes and no. You need to be so math is a huge, 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 huge field. It is there's you know basic arithmetic and there's algebra, there's trigonometry, geometry, calculus and it goes on from there it just keeps going um every time you think you figured it out you learned every time you think you found out all the different areas of math there's more to to understand about math but uh you need to be good at some of the basics of math to be to do programming but there's a lot of math you don't necessarily need to know to know programming but the more math you know the more you can do some other things with programming so for example today uh, machine learning, neural networks is a really big, a lot of interest in computer programming. There's a lot of complex math inside of um, building an engine for machine learning and neural networks. But you can use a library, an existing library, without having to understand all that math. So an analogy to cooking could be that uh, you have a recipe that calls for cream cheese. All right, you can go to the store and buy a block of cream cheese, at least you can in the US, uh, and use that in your recipe. You don't have to understand how to make cream cheese necessarily. It's helpful to understand that cream cheese contains dairy, contains milk, for example, but you don't necessarily need to know how to make cream cheese. So uh, that's kind of the same thing for computer science or computer programming and math, is that the more computer, more math you know, it can help you be a better programmer. Um, programming is a layer of abstractions and um, understanding I, I when I was working at this one company they had a uh, opportunity to come in and learn from one of the, some of the top engineers early before work and I went in and I remember distinctly I had taken some basic electronics I understood and gates and uh, or gates and stuff like that and I'd done a lot of programming but I didn't understand how um, a CPU and how memory actually used that AND gates and OR gates and the basic, those fundamental building blocks to work. And he diagrammed it out and drew it out and talked about the physics behind that. And it was fascinating. And I loved it and I'm glad I learned it. 
it's not something I use every day, but understanding that I think makes me a better programmer. So do you need to be good at math in order to learn programming? You need to be good at some of the basics of math, but you don't need to know all of math. You don't have to necessarily be into the more deep stuff, but um, algebra, some basic algebra, uh, basic arithmetic, things along those lines are definitely good. Uh, another question here, why do you think so many getting started education and materials for programming neglect testable design in maintainable code? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, there's a lot of aspects to computer programming and oftentimes finding the right way to introduce people to it without overwhelming them is tricky and so Usually, learning to program stuff is not necessarily about creating programs, but it is about um, understanding computation. Okay, so this goes back to the computer science is not necessarily about computers. At the same time, it's not necessarily about computer programs, amazingly. Um, now, being a software engineer means is more about creating maintainable code, creating robust code, creating programs that can be reliable, maintained, and work over the long term. And so computer engineering or software engineering, yeah, software engineering is more focused on that side of things, on the making programs. Computer science is not necessarily focused on that. Computer science is very high level theoretical, but it's implemented in computer programming languages. Now, there's, uh, I was gonna put a slide in about this and I didn't, but now I will talk about it anyway. There's this game called The Game of Life. Well, it's a game, in, uh, sort of, by, uh, can't remember his name. If you look it up, Conway, Conway's Game of Life. So this was a game that existed before electronic computers were a thing, or very early on. And it was had these very simple rules about you had a grid and you'd fill certain blocks in and there were ideas these were cells. And if they were alive, there was rules that if they had so many adjacent cells, they could die or they could stay the same or they could introduce new cells of life. Um, and so it was just a really simple simulation. And they were, people were doing this on graph paper, right? They would do each generation on graph paper and do all sorts of interesting things with it by hand. They were playing this game by hand. Later on, when computers... It timed out on me again. Okay, it looks like it's working again. So I have the window open here on the translation and uh, transcription as well. And if I see it stop, I thought stop. And so I was like, quick, what am I going to click on it again? Now it's working again. So this time it didn't disconnect from the microphone but it did stop but i caught it in time so uh yeah th so the computers came along electronic computers came along they wrote a program computer program to play conway's game of life on the computer and they discovered things about it that they didn't discover before because it was able to do all those generations that were done by hand on graph paper quickly and they discovered new things about this concept, this program that weren't apparent before by doing it by hand. Uh, same thing with graphs, drawing graphs. Uh, the Mandelbrot set was a famous uh, fractal that was graphed with a computer that couldn't have been graphed before. I remember when I was in um, school, my geometry teacher, this is right when the Texas Instruments TI-81, those big heavy blue graphing calculators were introduced, and he was really excited, came to me and showed me that you could graph this equation on here and this was something that you couldn't do before unless you had access to like a high-end uh not supercomputer but a high, you know a specialized computer system that was 
built around this idea of being able to do graphs. And here, this was a tool that all the students in the class were going to have that cost about $100 US to, and that gave them the ability to create this graph of this equation that wasn't something you could do when you were in school. You probably did, you know, the graphs and stuff like that by hand. This could do more than you could do that way. So uh, why doesn't uh, Getting Started stuff talk about uh, testable, maintainable code? Um, because you kind of have to learn the basics. You have to learn, the wa learn to walk before you can learn to run, right? Uh, you don't start walking by doing a marathon or mountain climbing. Testing and maintaining code, make, making testable and maintainable code is a good thing to, to learn about, but usually it's more important to learn the foundations, the fundamentals before you get there. And that's kind of one of the tricky things is how to uh, balance that out and how to get there. What's the difference between competitive programming and dynamic programming? Uh, I'm not sure that those terms are the terms you think they are, but I could be correct, incorrect. Let me look real quick. There is um, this. I'm doing. I should actually could share my screen, but. Um, Learning how to use the search engine is a really important part of computer programming. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so this is, so um, at least the thing I'm reading here says that um, competitive programming is this idea where you have teams trying to accomplish a task in the best way possible and best way can vary from competition to competition or it also says that um, competitive programming can refer to like programming interviews where you're coming in to apply for a job they'll often ask you these questions and one of the types of questions they'll ask you is about dynamic programming um, so dynamic programming is a uh, i'm going to bring up Wikipedia page here. So actually, I'm going to show you, since I talked about the importance of uh, searching. Wikipedia is a pretty good resource, typically. It shouldn't be your only resource, and you definitely should do some follow-up from there. But there's an interesting, um, let's see if I can do it on here. So Wikipedia has different translations, but they don't have it here. Sometimes, for some pages, you can do simple. Oh, it is. There is a thing there. So it's not always as complete, but a great example of this is um, I think our, our, our encryption is cool. Now, this article here is this goes back to the do you need to be good at math? That's some big math there. That's math that hurts my head. But you can actually go to, oh, this is the simple one. This is much simpler than the regular one, Ian. So this is the original one, and you can go to the simple version, and it's a simplified English version of uh, that page. Oops. Not that. Sometimes you have to dig around a little bit for it. Anyway, um, let's go back to dynamic programming. Uh, I mean, I don't know that it's going to be something I can really dive into, I think, right now. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of familiar with the basics of it, but not going to be something I can uh, cover in depth right now, for sure. Translation stopped again. All right. Got the transcription running again. Uh, let's see.
Oops, I put this in the wrong answer place. I put one of the answers in the wrong place. Sorry. Um, yes, computers follow directions uh, perfectly to do things that are complex, but they don't necessarily know what they're doing. Correct. Uh, So I am taking a little break right now to answer questions. Uh, let's see, most important, yeah, order of operations, that's a really important thing to be familiar with in mathematics. Um, there is, because that does kind of enter into programming. Uh, in programming, do I need to know what time complexity is and all that? You don't need to know it, but it is helpful. We need to know what it is helpful. Is web programming dying? I mean, lots of websites can be created instantly with pre-built templates and builder. So this is one of the big things you see a lot in programming. When I was in 1980 and first learned to program on Commodore VIC-20, I was like, this is what I want to do. I told everybody, I'm going to be a computer programmer when I grow up. And they're like, oh, don't do that because computer programming is going away because it's the computers are programming themselves. You don't need to learn computer programming. That's always happening. There's always things that are happening that are making it easier to program, but they're not forever, but for quite a while, there will always need to be somebody that can take the ideas, random ideas, and form them into something that can be fed to the computer so that the computer can learn to program or can create that program. The very first computer programs were you know people did punch cards or they had switches they would flip for individual bits and then they'd write it out that way in machine in binary machine code that thankfully has gone away for the most part <laughs> and we can use high level programming languages now but you still need computer programmers uh, is web programming dying i don't think so i think web's really important but there are a lot of other areas that are really growing as well so uh, again, I think, like I said, it, it's important to have kind of be multi-domain in what you know in your knowledge. Uh, web programming is certainly useful and important, but is not should not be the only thing you need to know. Okay, it turned off. Mic stays on and turned off again. <laughs> Can a software engineer make money at home? Yes. Uh, yeah, translation stopped again. All right, if I, you don't need to keep asking your questions over and over again. Oh, uh, Mustafa, I thought I'd, let me see if I can add you as a, uh, to help answer questions. So some people signed up as mentors and I tried to add them so they could help answer questions, but uh, I don't know that I got everybody added. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't make that change right now. Um, how far in development we go in a one week course? Mostly gonna focus on, well, there's a variety of things, some of the different levels. So the Danny wins on REST frameworks, that's a more advanced topic. So depending on where you're at, we'll determine how far you'll be able to go through this, but I'm gonna try and cover some of the basics uh, as well. Is it possible to skip some sessions to still get the certificate? You might need to catch the replay. Um, if someone doesn't know anything about programming, where should they start? This is a good place. Uh, there's a utility, a program called Scratch that I'm gonna show you as well. That's a great introductory thing. Um, What level of math do I need to get into blockchain and cryptocurrency? Uh, you're going to need to study a lot. So this is not a journey to the door, as the saying goes. It's a path stretching onto the horizon. Um, you can learn some basic stuff and get started in machine learning and cryptocurrencies and blockchain, but the more you know, the better. Uh, 
if you're asking that question, then you need to learn more as soon as you feel like you have. There's this uh, concept that, I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm not showing my screen now. No. Okay, so let's go back to sharing my screen again and talk about more about why learning computer programming. Okay, you should be sharing my screen again. Please do not spam the same question over and over and over again, or I will boot you. Um, if you ask it a couple times, that's one thing, but asking it 50 times in a row, I'm not gonna answer your question. Um, so one of the reasons to learn programming is we live in a world full of technology. It's everywhere, it, it, it's amazing. I have a, a Bluetooth headphone <laughs> I'm wearing right now so that I can hear the audio from the computer. Um, and I like the, the uh, using the Bluetooth one because most of the time you don't see it. So it's very small, but I have, you know, we have smartphones, we have computers, our, our TVs, our refrigerators, our toasters all have electronics in it, technology in it. So it, it's everywhere. It's around, all around us. And programming is the science of technology. Um, and I'm using some broad terms here, but most of the time when we talk about technology or things being high tech, we're referring to the idea of it having computers inside of it or programming inside of it and running code, running programs, um, microcontrollers and such. The other reason I don't learn programming is programming lets you automate boring things. In the movie Wally, -E, they program this robot to do the boring task of cleaning up all the trash on Earth, right? Uh, there's been articles about scientists who are doing scientific studies and they go and buy Lego Mindstorm sets and program, the, which is a, a programmable robotic, robotic set for Legos, and program it to do things like stirring a solution over a long period of time, for example, or doing something where it's got to like rotate something occasionally. They can program that with Lego Mindstorm really easily and build what would normally be a very specialized very expensive piece of equipment with an off-the-shelf product because they take a little bit of time to learn the basics of programming to do that. You can do, a lot of people use Arduino, which is a uh, electronic platform that you can program to build things that can automate boring things or automate repetitive things or otherwise just increase general quality of life. It's very accessible to, to people. Programming is big business. So in response, can I make $500,000 a year as a software developer, um, a software engineer? I don't know how much money you, you can make at it, but there are programmers and software engineers that make good money at it. Um, usually, if you want to make really, really good money at it, you probably need to use, it's not about the program, it's about the program solving a problem. So I just did an interview the day with a guy that runs a company that builds uh, software used in different industries. And he said he doesn't see himself as a computer programmer. He sees himself as a businessman that solves people's problems. And he's built this business and employs lots of people uh, providing livelihood for multiple families based on this software he's built. And he says, I'm not a computer programmer. I solve problems for people. I, provide a business solution for people. And that is where the money comes from. So you can be a phenomenal computer programmer and write some amazing programs, but if they're not something somebody's wanting to pay money for, you're probably not gonna make money at it, right? So you have to have both sides of that. So if you wanna be, make a fortune at computer programming, you can, but you have to have the, uh, both the business side and the computer programming side of that. Now. You could get a job as a computer programmer and somebody else does the business side, or you could start a business and hire somebody else to run the business side of things and potentially make a lot of money. A fortune, you'd make enough money to live off of nicely, but to make a fortune, like 500,000 a year, I don't know why you picked that number, you're gonna have, it's good, you could do that as a computer programmer, but you're gonna have to bring in the other side of that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you take some of the ideas you learn in computer programming about breaking things down into smaller parts then and being a, solving problems, 
that is a skill that can apply to everybody everywhere. So it's not necessarily just about writing computer programs, the concepts we're gonna learn, but it's all about breaking things down and solving problems. And at least I think programming is a lot of fun. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. I had uh, a niece of mine that I was teaching some programming stuff to, and she was kind of interested in it and kind of not, and uh, learned a little bit and then kind of got bored. But then later on, there was a game she was playing online that had this challenge. And I can't remember what game, well, it wasn't Roblox, but it was kind of like Roblox, if you're familiar with that one. If you're not, Roblox is a great way to learn programming, uh, especially aimed at teenagers. But um, they had this challenge that you could get this um, skin for her character. And she had to write some Lua code to solve this challenge. And we'd never talked about Lua before. And she sent me a message and like, hey, how do you do Lua? And I'm like, oh, well, here's some of the basics. And I gave her a little tutorial that I found online and gave her a, a couple tips on it. And then later I was talking to her mom, my sister, and she said that she went out and went through the trainings, the documentation on it, and figured out how to solve those problems in Lua in order to get the goal she wanted and got it. She was pretty cool about that. I said, you know what, that's really the key to programming is learning that this isn't some magical black box that you can never understand, but it's just a matter of breaking things down to smaller pieces. And then when you can find something fun to do with that and a fun way to apply it, then you're, and realize you have that tool you can pull out and use, then that is really what it is about being a computer programmer. How did my interest in programming develop? The question here. Uh, I think that's a good place to answer it. The my parents got me a Commodore VIC-20 back in 1980 something or other, and just the ability for me to type in some things on the computer and have the computer do what I wanted it to do and see my ideas show up on the screen was entrancing for me. And even to today, I still get an incredible kick about being able to write some code and then plug my phone into the computer and then have the program I wrote show up on the screen and do what I wanted it to do. Still tickles me to today. So um, that, that's really what it was for me, is just that idea that I, it's a way of expressing my imagination into the real world. So it's, for me, it's a lot like art, but it's also, I love being able to solve problems with it as well. Um, so why Delphi? Why learn Delphi? Now, this is sponsored by Embarcadero. Um, I would have made this conversation um, <laughs> so Bruce McGee, who's one of our MVPs uh, in the community, just asked, if someone makes their living developing software but fails the certification, are you going to make fun of them asking for a friend? Uh, it depends. If it's you, Bruce, then yeah, I'll make fun of you, but other people I wouldn't make fun of. <laughs> um, let's see. So why learn Delphi? One of the things is Delphi is very versatile. It works everywhere. It works on lots of platforms and can do lots of things. And so I think that's a, a great reason to learn Delphi. Like I said, this is sponsored by Embarcadero. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of Embarcadero's products, but I can tell you about how to get, as a student, a lot of these free to get started as well. Um, but the, the uh, yeah, Delphi works everywhere. So this is a platform. Oops, I messed up the slide there. But he took the idea. These are some of the platforms. So originally when Delphi launched back in 1995, it supported Windows 3.1 16-bit. But then over the years, it's expanded to multiple platforms. And actually, Mac OS um, ARM support is coming out, is on the roadmap. I can't say coming out because it's not released yet. And we can't say it's going to be here for sure until it's actually released. But it is in currently in the beta uh, that's going on right now. So it'll be be supported as well. But actually I'm running on a Mac and I'll be running Delphi on a Mac arm. Works today because of Rosetta, but uh, it's very powerful, very flexible, a lot you can do with it. So uh, a lot of other vendors, or uh, each platform vendor has their own tools that they want you to use. Sorry, my mouth's getting a little dry. Um, where they want you to make, let's say you wanna make a program that runs across multiple platforms, they would want you to use their own stack on each platform. And the downside is that you're re-implementing the same thing over and over again. There are some libraries that simplify that, but at the end of the day, they 
uh, not, I don't think any of them really do as good of a job as Delphi does. So Delphi gives you the ability to make one project that can be one program that can run across all the platforms, the, the different platforms we support. Uh, it can also, it's, it's very flexible in that as well. I don't want to get too much into that. Um, same idea. So yeah, Delphi is flexible. You can make any kind of app. Uh, there's a lot of people that make one of the probably Delphi's primary use cases is what I could like call line of business applications, which are applications that talk to a database in a company that provides the translation stuff again. I don't know what I'm in presenter mode. Conversations. Um, it says Mike stays on and it says you're in presenter mode. It will stay on, but then it keeps turning off. <laughs> it, it's a very cool service. Hopefully the translations are good, but uh, I don't know why it keeps disconnecting the microphone. Uh, anyway, so Delphi lets you do these line of business type applications. I see people that do games with Delphi frequently. It's not a game platform necessarily. There's other things that might be more suited to games, but you could certainly use Delphi to get there. Whereas other game specific platforms probably are not as flexible in the other direction. Uh, I see people making mobile applications, web application, desktop applications, database applications, et cetera. Very flexible, lets you do a lot of things. Another thing, actually, I was did an interview this morning with Dr. Kevin Bond talking to him about uh, Delphi's use in education, and he brought up a good point, is that Delphi has the, um, it's mul has multi -par multiple paradigms in the language in that you can do functional programming, which is uh, a simpler type of programming versus object-oriented programming, whereas most many other things are just one or the other, whereas Delphi lets you use both. And actually, you can go beyond that, but those are the two um, inherent paradigms that are involved in the language. We don't need to get exactly what that all that means just yet. Uh, we can talk about that later. But Delphi's flexibility makes it really suitable, well suitable for that, in that you can do very, very simple things with Delphi without having to understand all the complexity. So this goes back to the question earlier about why don't introductory courses talk about testing and maintainability? Because that's a more complex topic, right? And so you want to introduce people small steps, small things, so they can start small and work their way up. This is another thing about Delphi flexibility is that it gives you the ability to work at different levels of development. So you can, uh, Delphi was like a rig the original low code. You hear that talked about a lot today, but with Delphi, you can drop these components on the form and do a lot of programming, create a lot of functionality without having to write hardly any code at all, sometimes no code. Uh, occasionally I've gotten demos of something and I go to look at the code and I'm like, there's no code here, what happened? And then it's like, oh, it's it's all done at the visual layer. It, um, and there's actually add-ons for Delphi that let you even do more, even more visually without having to write code. Delphi also has these libraries that are included with it as well that you can do a lot of code writing. You can write as much code as you wanna write. Um, you can re-implement, because Delphi is written in Delphi, you can re-implement all the features of Delphi in Delphi. And we also have a lot of uh, technology partners that build components for Delphi to expand what it can do in Delphi because Delphi lets you do that. And some of them actually build components in Delphi and then provide those components to other languages because uh, Delphi lets you do that low level stuff and export that functionality to other languages. And then the last thing is that there's this really low level that you don't always need to get down here, but if you need to manually allocate memory or use pointers or inline arithmetic, or I'm sorry, inline algebra or platform APIs, you can still do that with Delphi as well. And so it makes it easy to work at whatever level of abstraction you wanna work at uh, to get a lot done. Delphi is also very easy to read. And I could have done a better job on the slide, but I'll show you what I'm showing. This is a really simple if statement. In um, a lot of languages, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, use curly braces. They're very symbol oriented. Whereas Delphi uses English words for a lot of things. Um, Basic also uses more English words than symbols. I personally find Delphi easier to read because of use of parentheses like this, but that might be a preference thing. There's nothing wrong with nothing. Now, saying this, I'm not saying 
there's anything wrong with C++, JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, et cetera, those are good languages too. But I believe that Delphi is easier to read because if X equals one, then begin write one, right? If, okay, X equals one, oh, we have to assume that this means then begin, right? I, I, so I think this reads more like English, so it makes it easier to understand and easier to maintain that code that's written in Delphi. Um, one thing about computer programming is it's more about reading code than it is writing code. A lot of people think it's all about writing code, but you read code more often than you write code in a, a career rated to computer programming. You're reading the code you've written, you're reading the code other people have written, you're reading, um, you're reading code all the time. You read way more code than you write. Even if you spend your day just writing code, you're still reading the code you've written right then to write the next the code you're adding to it. So Delphi uses Object Pascal programming language, or Delphi is kind of an evolution of Object Pascal, which is based on Pascal, which was invented by Nicholsworth to teach good programming practices. So fundamentally, it teaches good programming practices in using it, but it's been expanded to be a fully powerful, useful programming language. So you can get more done in less time, which is great, productivity is a good thing. Uh, you don't need to copy yourself. It makes it easy to um, make your code reusable, part of your code reusable, so that you can uh, leverage what you've done before or leverage what other people have done to do more. You don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, as it were, when you're writing a program. And there's a huge, huge, huge library of components that you could add into Delphi to do more things. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, Delphi is easier to learn and use easiest. I don't know, there's other things that might be considered easiest, but it, I think Delphi does a good job of striking that balance between power, flexibility, and ease of use. So we do offer Delphi Community Edition. So I'm gonna jump out here to this page here and uh, recommend that you download, sign up and download this if you haven't already. Uh, I'll put the link in here. Um, we do, uh, I'll put the links for the other ones as well. Because later today I'll be doing a session on installing this and getting started. Uh, you probably can figure out the installation on your own. Uh, I probably would have been better if I had made a video that I gave you ahead of time that talked about how to do the installation and such, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> so there's actually there's videos online for the previous version of Community Edition you can use. But Community Edition is made specifically for hobbyists and students. Uh, if you are a professional computer programmer already making uh, $5,000 in revenue, then you need to go buy the professional edition, which is way less than $5,000. But you can read the FAQs to understand if you qualify or not. Community edition is not a trial. If you're a professional programmer and you want to try Delphi out, download the Delphi trial. It's a 30-day trial. If after 30 days you're still not there yet, you can talk to sales. They can give you an extension. It depends on who you're talking to. Um, don't say, Jim told me you'd give me an extension because I didn't say that. I said they can. Um, but the Community Edition is a great thing for students that want to start out learning programming. So there's Delphi Community Edition. There's also um, C++ Community Edition, which is here. Put this link in here, which lets you use C++. So uh, in my opinion, Delphi is easier to learn than C++, but there are some advantages to C++ as well. Uh, there's advantages to both. So I will cover installing C++ and we do have some other content around C++ later in the week. I know more Delphi than C++, so I'm not gonna go into too much of the C++. I'll do some of the basics later today. Uh, and then we all have a number of other free tools as well. Um, we have uh, Dev C++ and PyScripter, our other great, uh, and C++, these are other great free tools. So Dev C++, is an open source C++ IDE that we've updated and expanded, given a, a new user interface, support for the latest uh, compilers, latest versions of Windows, and it is a it's available for free download, no strings attached. It's a free open source IDE. PyScripter is a open source Python IDE. Let me put the, the links in here for this. Do C++? and PyScripter is an open source Python ID. Both DevC++ and PyScripter are developed in 
Delphi. Oops. Found the length of time that that'll run. Wow, my ear's still weird now. They don't have that in my ear anymore. Feels like I'm like changing out air pressure. Sorry, let me get a drink. Okay. I could put the other one in later if I need to. Um, so yeah, Dev C++ and PyScripter are both written in Delphi. Uh, you can get the source code for those. You can make your own version of them if you want to. Uh, so that's a great thing, great way to start. So uh, Python, PyScripter is right here. It's the Python ID. Put that, paste that in here as well. I'm not going to cover Dev C++ specifically, but I will cover PyScripter uh, later today. And then we can also have um, our, one of our C++ compilers available as a free download too. So you can choose from any of those as a, a great way to get started. But I, like I said, I, I will cover C++ Builder Community Edition, Delphi Community Edition, and PyScripter. So do download um, I keep putting it in presenter, it turned off again. I put it in presenter mode and it comes up with a message that says, presenter mode is now turned on. You can speak continuously without being interrupted. Remember to mute yourself when you're done to avoid picking up stray sounds from your surroundings. But yet it keeps turning off presenter mode automatically. Even though the window is in the foreground, not minimized. I, don't know. I love the technology. It might be because I'm using the free version that I have to, uh, may have to pay money. I'll have to look into that to get it to keep translating. Uh, Bruce commented on the $500,000 a year person that you're not going to make $500,000 a year trading time for money. So if you're being paid X dollars per hour to write a program, you're not going to make $500,000 a year. That's true. You're going to need a, a large scale strategy to leverage something that goes back into the thing about business. Uh, Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna cover Delphi Community Edition, C++ Community Edition, and PyScripter later today and later this week will be covered. <clears throat> um, let me see, I'm gonna take a quick gander through some of the questions and see if there's any questions I need to address. Um, So the question here, do you, can I use Dev C++ or PyScripter to make a program for Raspberry Pi? Um, so neither of those IDEs will run on Raspberry Pi, but PyScripter will uh, let you connect remotely to Raspberry Pi. Oh, I wonder if I could, I will try and do a demo of that in the Raspberry Pi session. I will try. I've not done it recently, but you can um, on your, uh, you run, PyScriptor on your Windows computer and it can connect over the network using SSH to log into the Raspberry Pi and then control the Raspberry Pi Python to write programs and debug programs running on Python or on the Raspberry Pi. Real powerful stuff. So if you're wanting to go down that route, that's something you can do. Um, Uh, the recordings will be on the, um, let me put the link here. You'll be able to find them all from the Learn to Code Summer Camp homepage. There'll be links out to the recordings and each individual day uh, as I get them posted. Unfortunately, um, a lot of this is just going to be on the bottleneck on that. Uh, can I install Delphi and C++ Builder Community Edition on the same computer? Not without a virtual machine. They do not coexist side by side in the same operating system. If you do have virtual machines, then yes, you can. Uh, but that being said, read the FAQs. It talks about that in there and the license agreement. 
I'm not wanting to encourage you to do something that do not does not fall into the license agreement. Why Delphi CE now install full Windows Development Kit as a requirement? You can actually skip that step. Um, we're required because of some things we're required to give you the option to install it, but um, you don't have to install it. Can I install 10.4.2 CE along with 10.3.1 Architect Edition without fear of interference? Um, technically, you probably can install those two side by side, but I'm going to say that you will want to make sure that you are not violating the license agreement. So do read the um, license agreement always. So <laughs> always have a backup. <laughs> backup your computer before installing any software. You should be okay. But in theory, it's anything's possible. I have not tried that particular scenario. I think I've talked to the people that have installed 10.3 and 10.4 to Community Edition at the same time, and they've worked fine, but uh, certainly not guaranteeing any of that. Are we going to have a Delphi compiler for Raspberry Pi? Um, why not lower Free Pascal? So you can use Free Pascal to target Raspberry Pi today with Object Pascal. Uh, Free Pascal is another great, great um, Object Pascal programming language out there. I I would love to see an official Delphi support for it, but that's not happening yet. It's not on the roadmap yet. I'll keep pushing for it though. Um, Can I study Pascal instead of Delphi? When you are studying Delphi, you are studying Pascal. Uh, Delphi is a superset of Pascal. Uh, there are some things that you will learn in Delphi that you cannot do in regular Pascal. And there probably might be some things you do in regular Pascal that aren't compatible with Delphi just because of the way it's evolved. But generally the big strokes, the big things are the same or, uh, from Pascal are compatible with Delphi. How does Delphi deal with Docker cloud providers? Um, how does Delphi deal with Docker uh, cloud providers, recurrent compiling, etc.? Uh, so there is doc you can use Docker with Delphi. There is we do have some Docker images that contain interbase or that you can use for debugging into a Docker container and stuff like that. Rad server, it's another uh, enterprise architect version feature of Delphi. It's not included in the community edition, but uh, it's something if you go for the paid version you can get that does run in uh, Docker containers. Although you can, uh, if you don't mind setting up yourself, you can use Docker without uh, from, you could do it from community edition as well. Yeah, so community edition has the same features and functionality as professional, except for a few things, mostly around the license agreement, Read the license agreement, uh, not just around community edition, but occasionally I've told people they can do things that it's like, technically you can figure out a way to do this, but it's not officially supported. So uh, do check that out. Joe says he hates curly braces. I, you know, I don't hate them, but I think they're, I think it's easier to read without curly braces. Let's see, I have a problem when installing 10.42 community edition and also the network license version in our university after installation completed. BDS does not compare and how an error occurred. You're going to have to talk to your network administrator possibly on that. Um, there may be some things that they have done to tighten down the uh, computers there. Or um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. So uh, someone pointed out C++ and Python and other languages can also be flexible like Delphi. Yes. There, there is there is not one perfect language that does everything in all situations. All right. Uh, people love doing benchmarks, and you can have you can have two programs benchmarked and then make one and have one win in a benchmark and then make one change and have the 
to go the other direction. The, the skill of the programmer can have a huge impact on that. Uh, there was an ongoing debate. So technically, assembly language is the, you can write in pure machine code, which is the code that runs on the CPU. Or you could write an assembly language, which is a one-to-one -one translation for what you're writing in assembly for what it does in machine code. Or you can write in a higher level programming language like, um, so technically C is the next highest level, and then you have like C++ and Delphi here at this level, and then you have your script, your uh, C sharps and your Javas are at this level. They compile to a bytecode that then compiles at runtime. And then you have your scripting languages, your Pythons and your JavaScript and your Lua's and your whatever up here at the top level. So the argument is that, oh, if you can assembly language or machine code is the best because everything goes there through that to get to the CPU. The problem is the skill required to do that. Most, even most of the best assembly programmers cannot outperform the compilers that are available at this stack. And so to pick, like I said, it really, you're not gonna win any argument about what's better. Like, so uh, I can say that there is advantages, but that's not to say that it's all better in every scenario. Uh, uh, let's see, There, I will have recordings posted on the, you can find the recordings from the homepage for this uh, eventually. Is Delphi, or Embarkadero the only company with a Delphi IDE compiler? So Delphi is um, our implementation of Object Pascal. The language is compatible. There is a, a number of other companies also have Object Pascal implemented IDEs and compilers, but they are not Delphi ones. They have varying degrees of Delphi compatibility, some more than others. So um, same the same way that you might learn C++, uh, Microsoft Visual C++ has some things that behave differently than C++ plus builder C++ versus uh, Intel C compiler. Each C compiler has some subtle changes. Now, depending on how you write your program, it may work across all those compilers or it may not. So, uh, there for, I'm not sure if there, actually like, there still is different Java virtual machines available. I can't remember if they other ones went out of business or not uh, because business things, but you know, you could write for something in Java that might work on one Java JVM versus another or work differently there. So uh, yes and no. Yes, the more you know, the more you don't know, the more you, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. That is so true, thank you. Um, Computer, yeah, so computer science is not all about programming. Computer science is about computing. It's about problem solving. Uh, programming is a subset of that, but it's not the entirety of computer science. Yes, they will be on YouTube. They be on YouTube. Uh, oh. I feel silly. I forgot there's a couple other websites that I wanted to post as well. Let me share my screen again. Uh, so there is learndelphi.org, which I'll have a lot of these replays will be available on here eventually as well under the resources. But there's a lot of other great resources here, videos, um, books. Uh, there's a learndelphi.org YouTube channel. that you can check out. There's also a link to learndelphi.tv, which is another great site. Uh, so definitely check out learndelphi.org if you're wanting to learn Delphi. If you're wanting to learn C++, learn, I think it's cpp. Dot, um, learn, this is not it. Uh, is it learn cpp.org, I think. I should know this. I just switched to a new browser. Nope, that's not it. Maybe it's learn C++. Uh, 
I'm embarrassed, but I don't have this. There it is. So I, like I, I should know this. I'm out here a lot, but I just switched to new browser and I don't have bookmarks in here yet. So this is a great site for learning uh, C++. There's a lot of resources and tutorials. I'll put these links in the chat as well. Um, um, so if you're interested in games, actually, there is some videos on games in here from previous Delphi boot camps and stuff are on there as well. And then there is, I think it's Python GUI.org. Yes. So these are uh, all these sites um, are related to a market arrow. There are other sites, obviously, that aren't related to a market arrow that you can learn um, Delphi, Python, and C++. But these are the ones that we help uh, maintain and uh, promote. OK. Um, Is Delphi a famous programming language? Yes, uh, it's not. There are a lot of niche programming languages that even myself as a programmer with way too many years of experience have not heard of or maybe heard of once, but um, Delphi is not. I think most programmers that have a lot of experience are familiar with Delphi, may have used it at some point, um, but it's not necessarily the most popular programming language. Python is definitely, Python and Java are probably the two most popular programming languages. C, C++ are up there as well. Um, what language should I learn first? I would recommend Delphi, which I will do a little bit to introduce you to that during this. Python's another great one to learn if you're just starting. It's hard to say what's dying. It, it, in computer science, they may just not be growing as fast as other ones. Um, how are programming languages developed? First, you need to learn how to program, and then you can learn how to create a programming language. They're, the fundamentals of it is not that complicated, but it gets complicated quick to make it a good programming language. Uh, I already have Visual Studio Code. Do I need C++ Builder? Is it better? It's different. I would say there's some advantages to both. I have both installed on my computer, but um, uh, it's it's like saying um, I already have a hammer. Do I need a screwdriver? Yeah, if you're going to drive screws, I mean you can hit a screw with a hammer and get it in the get it in there eventually. But it's usually a good idea to have a screwdriver too, right? And then you're like, well, I already have a Phillips screwdriver. Do I need a, a regular flathead screwdriver? Yeah, you probably do. Um, but not only if you're going to do that, use that for that purpose. So it's a, another tool that you can use uh, for what we'll be covering in the boot camp. We'll be talking about C++ Builder. We'll really be talking about C, uh, Visual Studio Code. So uh, better has advantages and disadvantages, but um, that's interesting. So I noticed that the transcriber didn't turn off, but it stopped transcribing. What? Stop transcribing now. Um, let me do this. Let me see if I can join again. Um, unmute. And now it should be transcribing again. It is. All right. 
cool technology, but apparently I still need to figure some things out with how it works. Um, all right, where was I? Uh, can we use Visual Studio for Python and C++? Yes, so Visual Studio Code does support Python and C++. There are um, advantages to using C++ Builder or PyScripter. Uh, so we'll need two Windows 10 licenses to do this. Not necessarily. So if you have, um, you can install, if you already have a Windows 10 license, you can install a virtual machine using that same license on that same computer because you're still on technically the same computer. Um, again, I'm not going to get into the nuances of Microsoft licensing, unfortunately. Um, yes, you could still use 10.3 Community Edition. A lot of the same stuff will still apply. Uh, when will we see a web framework built with Delphi? There's already web frameworks built with Delphi. Uh, web Broker are, is built into it. There's IntraWeb, there's TMS Web Core, uh, Unigui are all web frameworks built with Delphi as well, offered through third parties. Uh, I think, so which programming language do I recommend to learn in the year 2021? Honestly, so I work for Embarcadero. I do think Delphi is a very powerful functional programming language. And if your goal is to get things done, I think Delphi is a great thing to learn. But I think Python and JavaScript and C++ have more uh, job openings for them. So it depends what your goal is. Um, not to so say you can't get stuff done with those other languages. Uh, you can do, you can also integrate these together. Now, Delphi is possibly the easiest to learn easier to learn than uh, JavaScript and C++. Delphi, I think it's easier to learn. So there's some advantages there. So it's like, if you're like, I am really smart, I pick up things like that, then hey, dive right into assembly and C++. Possibly. But if you're like, I want to learn something, I want to start with a tool that's easy for me to learn and then take those concepts and apply it to other languages, I think Delphi is the way to go. Um, will I learn code during this camp? Hopefully. Uh, Sure, you can stay on that. Uh, I think Delphi. I think Delphi is the ID on Pascal's language. Yeah, so technically yes, but Delphi is also an extension to the language as well. So it you can use the terms. That's like Arduino programming. Arduino's a company. Arduino's the device. Arduino's the IDE. It's uh, uh, overloaded. You see it a lot in programming languages. Yes, can we mix uh, object-oriented programming language with procedural programming in Delphi? Yes, that's one of the things that's great about it. Yes. Okay, let me fire up my virtual machine here and, and I'll try and get some more questions again later. So this is a actually Windows 11 virtual machine just because um, I can't leave well enough alone. Uh, uh, where's it at? Yeah. So I am technically, this is, it was originally a Windows 10 virtual machine, but I upgraded it to Windows 11, but it is, um, running Windows 11 beta in a beta version of Parallels on a Mac ARM computer. Not recommended, but if you want to push the envelope, you certainly can. It's working here. So um, I did want to start with showing you this, though. And I will paste this link in here. So if you've never programmed before, this is an interesting place to start. and this is a project maintained by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, very prestigious technical university, as a tool for learning to program. And it's it's called Scratch. There are university courses that teach intro to programming using this as a way to get started with programming. It is not going to be a, um, you're not going to make a program that you're going to ship Maybe you could, but you're not going. This is not something. This this tool is not about building a finished program that you provide as a, a solution for somebody, but it is more about 
the process of learning to program. So I will give you, so there's a tutorial here that you can watch, got a little video that explains, um, has audio. I'm not gonna get into that, but I will show you some basics here. Um, so this will make him move 10 steps. I need to go to, well, let's just run this and see. I haven't used this version of Scratch in a while, or this version of Scratch yet. Where's the, oh, there it is. I need to find the start. That's, okay. All right, there it is. So when the flag, right there is clicked, then this guy will move 10 steps. So, or if I just click on it. So I click this and he moved 10 steps. So let's make that 100. So it's a little more obvious. And click that, there he moved 100 steps. Uh, then I can give him another one. I can say, um, turn 90 degrees, right? And actually let's put another one here, go to, certain position so let's run it again oops let's put zero oops all right so this let me uh go to um uh, let's see Let's put this here, zero, zero, and point in direction. All right, so, um, sorry, this is this is the basic program I have here. So this just lets me reset that, although I can put this here too. So he always starts in the same place. So this make it so I always starts in the same place each time. Uh, he's always gonna start in the middle, zero, zero. So this is a, a graph grid and he's gonna be facing 90 degrees, which is to the right. And then I click this button, he's gonna move 100 steps and then turn 90 degrees. So we see there it goes like that. And so this is an example of programming, right? It's just a series of instructions. they will do exactly what I tell it to do. Now, without this, these first two parts, like I had originally, then it doesn't start from the begin start in the same location each time. It's gonna start from wherever it left off, which isn't what I wanted to do. So he's just gonna keep going around in a box, right? but or make it a square. But by putting this in here, he's gonna start the same place each time. He does that, okay? Now, so if you're new to programming, this is, like I said, a great place to start to learn programming. There are some tutorials in here you can come in. Um, I taught a, a class with some kids learning to program with this, and I'll tell you what, they did some really interesting stuff. I was like, wait, are you still using Scratch? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty impressive. So you can do a lot of fun stuff with this. Like I said, it's not necessarily something you're going to uh, ship a uh, ship a game. It's not going to be your next big AAA title game, but you could make something fun that you could share with your friends on here or uh, family members. You can do interesting things with it. There's quite a bit you can do with this uh, making music. Um, a little video it'll show you how to make music with it. it it's a great way to just to get the basics of programming right so the basics of programming being providing that recipe that the computer can do over and over and over again right so it by it will do every time i click this button here it'll do exactly the same thing over and over and over again right um So actually, I'm gonna try this here. Let's try glide. So this is a new one here. I can say glide. So he glides to the starting point now. So that way you can see him making the move, right? Um, and so instead of saying move 100 steps, I will do that and I'll say, glide to 
there. And then, all right, so now you can see it moving. So again, this is pretty cool stuff here. Um, let's put that there. Oops. All right, I'm not gonna mess with this anymore. There's a lot of great um, assets in here that you can use. You can get different characters. Um, costumes, they call them. So the fundamental idea, so here you can see some of the different characters you can use, different at, uh, sprites. But you think of this as a sprite, right? And a sprite is a an object, a graphical object that you move around on the screen. There's a, program called, a programming tool called Turtle that's also used to teach programming that's kind of the same sort of thing. In Turtle, you just say, I want to move the turtle to the right in this many steps, up, rotate, you know, stuff like that. The same thing you do with Scratch. The advantage of Scratch is that um, you don't have to understand what the words to type are. You just drag and drop the little bits of code onto here. Now, so this is a lot similar to Delphi's components. So in Delphi, we have components that are similar to this that are just little bits of behavior you can drag onto your application to introduce new behavior. Um, so great place to start if you're wanting, especially wanting to build games. Um, you can come out here and do some stuff. You can actually make some really fun stuff on here. So it don't dismiss it. Um, supports multiple languages. And hopefully it doesn't turn up. <laughs> All right, the translation stuff again. So that's Scratch. Um, all right, so let me jump out here to, uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick sneak peek taste of Delphi. If you've done Delphi before, this isn't gonna be anything new for you. But I'm just gonna create a new Delphi multi device application. Oh, I will point out, I'm running Rad Studio, which contains both Delphi and C++ Builder. And with everything else that's going on on my computer, my CPU is completely pegged, so it's running really slow. Come on, work. Wow, okay. Um, what is a virtual machine? That's a great question. So a virtual machine is... A, a technology that lets you run an operating system inside another operating system. So um, I'm running on a Mac, but thanks to this virtual machine technology parallels, I'm able to run Windows inside of a, a little box on there. So like you might open up a program like a word processor or a virtual machine lets you open up a entire virtual, as in uh, virtualized doesn't exist, uh, computer inside of another computer, inside another operating system. So uh, the question here, I've already learned Pascal, would it be a waste of time to learn Delphi now? No, I would still, learning Delphi would be valuable. It uh, introduces a lot of things for you to do, uh, uh, to do, oh dear, what is this? Okay, yep, that's a uh, both a hammer and a screwdriver at the same time. <laughs> I was hoping to view that in another window. Okay. Yes, so Stencil, another one similar to uh, Scratch that you can use as well. There's a number of tools out there. Uh, and my screen should be being shared right now. Uh, Susan, everybody else seems to be able to see it. And it's keeps asking for a valid serial number when I open it. Any ideas why? Uh, if you're still you may need to activate it may not have activated or may not have access to the internet community edition does need to be able to verify your serial number online and so if your virtual machine doesn't have access to the internet and it can't um work okay so quick basics of delphi here 
I'm going to do a couple little demos here. We're almost out of time. Uh, I'm going to just do one demo and then a uh, do some more questions. So this is a really simple demo. This is your component palette over here. I'm just going to drop some components down the form. And this is running really slow, so I will do a different virtual machine later so that I don't have the slowdown of everything. The All the software I'm running to do the streaming is definitely slowing this computer down. So I have, I've put three components down here. And now if I run this, there's actually gonna be some basic functionality here, even though I haven't written any programming, any code at all. So right this, now it's compiling it into a program. And then here's the program. So this is a program, you could copy this, give it to somebody else, someone else can run it on their own Windows computer. Now, right now, you can see when I move over the button, the button changes color. And when I click the button, it changes, right? So that's some behavior, some functionality that I got built into that component. Um, but then I can write some code to add additional functionality here to make this more interesting. I can come in here and say on click. So this is the object inspector, has properties. Uh, I can change the capture of the button. Um, All right, so now it says click me, and I come here to the events and say on click. And now I write a little code. And don't worry about if you're not understanding all this right now. I'm just kind of giving you a glimpse of some of the stuff we can we'll talk about later today and tomorrow and the rest of the week. So I'll say list box one. And so if we go back to here, each of these components has a name. This one's named list box one. We can see the name right here, list box one. This one's named edit one. That's just the default name it gets when you put it on the put it on there. So I'm gonna say list box one, and list box one has oops, clicked the wrong thing. These properties, these members of it that I can use, and one of those is called items. So items is the items in the list box, and I'm gonna say add. I want to add a new item to the list box, and I want to add edit one, which is the edit box, the text from edit one to it. And then run this. Usually it's much faster and it didn't render. Let me try this again. This is, I, I'm not just making it up. This is legit running really uh, surprisingly slow because of everything else going on. My, I can see my CPU level is like totally pegged. So click me so I can type hello summer camp. In that text box, I click click me and add to the list there. So uh, I've made a simple program here with very little code. And that's one of the great things about Delphi. And then I could deploy this to uh, multiple platforms, uh, Android, iOS, Mac OS, and Windows. Now, I, like I said, I'm running Rad Studio, which is the full version of uh, Delphi and C++ Builder. But everything I'm showing you right now works in Delphi Community Edition. Later today, I'll show you how to walk you through installing Delphi Community Edition as well so that you can see how to install that if you haven't installed it yet, and then do some basic uh, getting started stuff with Delphi as well and dive a little more to that. And so now I'm going to go back to questions for the remainder of the time here, which I think I had originally planned to be done right now, but let's see. We can still try and get some questions here. Um, So if you didn't, if you want to get the link for this, go to the, um, for tomorrow. If you're signed up now, you'll be signed up for the mainstream tomorrow, but there will be more links. Um, there'll be links to each day on the homepage for the summer camp, which I just put the link in there for you. If someone wants to go into cybersecurity, should he learn Linux first or Python? Uh, if you want to go into cybersecurity, probably, I mean, Python, learning Linux is more fundamental to cybersecurity than Python. Python is part of it, but I think Linux is more fundamental to that. Uh, yes, there will be a replay. Um, yes, Rise of Legions, yes, it was. Rise of Legions was made with Delphi. There's a number of games out there made with Delphi. Um, some of them you can get all the source code for, and there's some, uh, I will show later some games that you from that we have available 
that you can get to use as well. Yeah, Del so Delphi is not, the, like I said, most the most popular programming language. It is a pop, it is, I would say, fairly popular programming language, but it's, uh, there are more popular programming languages, but it's still in use. There's still lots of jobs for it. Yes, you can use learndelphi.org content with lectures and share with your students. Um, Okay, so Delphi, the programming, the IDE is, uh, you install that on Windows and then you can use that to deploy, to create programs that run on iOS, Mac OS, Android, Windows, et cetera. Um, so you install Delphi on Windows and then use that to deploy to other platforms. And the transcription stopped again. I wonder if I, I, I wonder if it's a timeout. And it just times out after a little bit of time, and I can just set a timer for it to remind me to keep um, restarting. Maybe I will look into it some more before the next one. Uh, we uh, PyScripter is just an IDE. So PyScripter is a Python IDE, yes, that you, you can use to program for Python. Uh, what do I write for company in the Delphi Community Edition download? If you are not involved in a company organization, you could put uh, none, not applicable. Yes, we will. Hey, plus three, buddy. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Justin commented, Delphi is not case sensitive. Uh, other languages are case sensitive, which I know some people think it's a good thing. I personally don't. I, I do try to use consistent capitalization in my code. But in other languages, if you say, if you have something that you're referring to, and you refer to it as a with a low, lowercase spelling versus a proper spelling where the capitalization where the first letters capitalized other programming languages would see those two different things two different identifiers i can't think of why you would ever want to do that <laughs> so the fact that you can introduce unexpected behavior by using the wrong case of a identifier seems annoying to me so that is definitely an advantage Delphi has. Delphi creates programs that run on Linux, the Enterprise Delph, Enterprise Edition. Delphi makes programs for Linux. The Professional and Community Edition does not support Linux. Linux is a premium feature. The schedules are the same for other sessions. Uh, so you can find the schedules for today, here, the this is the mainstream, which will have. Uh, oh, I did. I'll can add. I'll add the list to the what's in the mainstream, and you'll get an email about what's coming here as well. Uh, is Delphi inspired from Visual Studio Basic or Visual Studio Code? No. So there was well, sort of. It's complicated. Uh, Delphi was released in 1995. There was VB, whatever it was back then, um, Delphi in many ways leapfrogged what Visual Basic could do. And then Visual Basic was took some things that Delphi did and added Visual Basic and then actually hired the guy that developed Delphi. Microsoft hired that guy, Andrew Halsberg, to come and he helped develop C Sharp and the .NET framework in Visual Studio.net or Visual Basic.net and all the other things definitely were inspired by Delphi. So um, if you were to look at the ancestry, inheritance of all these languages, they always cross-pollinating between each other and inspired by each other. What's the difference between Rad Studio and Delphi? So uh, Rad Studio, the product that Embarcadero offers, includes both 
Delphi C++ Builder, as well as Interbase. Uh, Rad Studio can also be used to refer to the IDE that the Delphi runs inside of. Um, Delphi, you can buy Delphi the product or Delphi Community Edition for free is just the Delphi programming language does not also include C++ Builder. The, um, whereas Rad Studio includes both. So Rad Studio is the bundle or the IDE, whereas Delphi is the one language. Um, it can also say the Delphi IDE or the Delphi framework or the Delphi programming language can all be referring to parts of that. Um, I think I've turned off, so I turned my screen sharing on or off right now. The screen sharing is off because I'm not talking about what's on the screen. Um, so right now is kind of a general overview. I showed a little bit Delphi, but I will show some basic C++ later in the later stream, uh, which I can bring up the schedule for that real quick here and show you when that's going to be. So it is um, almost 1 p.m. Central or, oh, shoot. I need to get out of here because I got to start the next session. Um, I got to wrap up. I forgot time zones. I'm, I'm in mountain time and was thinking mountain time, but in central time, which is what the schedule is, um, Hold on, let me make sure. <laughs> Panic attack. Uh, yeah, so I did not realize, I thought I had a break between these. So I got to close this set stream down so I can get ready for the next stream. Uh, so yeah, it's you're if you're registered for this one, you already have the link for the next one, but it's going to be in a separate. It's going to start separately in just a few minutes here. So I'm going to go ahead and close this down. There will be a replay. Uh, visit. There's the link right there. If you go there, you'll find links to everything else. It may take a while for me to get it all up there, but uh, we should get it all up there eventually. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you in the next stream.